Hello and welcome to my video review of CK 3s first core expansion, Legends of the Dead. Keeping record with my previous videos, I took some time away to play the game and allow the devs to patch out the bugs and issues so that when I came to evaluate what it brings to CK 3, I do so with better merit to the actual completed vision of the DLC as it shall be for the foreseeable future and its contribution to the greater amalgamation of content for the game. But before I give my perspective on the different aspects of Legends of the Dead, let's cover the big changes that actually come in this package with its free update and paid content. Starting with the free content update 1.12 Scythe, we have Plagues, allowing for diseases to visually spread across the map, infecting characters from barony to barony to better represent the dangers of medieval epidemics. This is accompanied by relevant protections, such as court physician tasks, hospital buildings, age health distinctions, and more. Legitimacy is a new mechanic to reflect your right to rule. Similar to the stress bar, the legitimacy bar can rise or decline, with different tiers offering bonuses or malice, depending on if you are seen as legitimate or illegitimate. The map table. By zooming out of the main game map, you will create a 3D world space table with a map on it and various ornaments around the set. A purely cosmetic addition, but one that does provide thematic immersion. Character visuals is an umbrella term to describe how character models have undergone a series of additional improvements to allow for dynamic male pattern baldness, progressive scarring from injury, disease graphical variation, and other changes to make your characters look more alive, and also dead, I suppose. The main Legends of the Dead paid content includes Legends, an alternative approach to ZK2's bloodlines in which you can aim to glorify the achievements, myths, or piety of you or your ancestors to achieve a variety of rewards. Akin to the plague mechanics, Legends spread across the map as rulers espouse them, giving relevant buffs to their legend type of either legitimizing, heroic, or holy. Dynasty Legacies The DLC offers two new Dynasty Legacies, one for helping to improve the bonuses of Legends with the Heroic Bloodlines Legacy, and one for helping to improve you and your descendants' legitimacy with the Legitimacy Legacy. The Black Death While the free update did introduce the Plague mechanic, the Legends of the Dead DLC expands on it by allowing the historically devastating Black Death to run rampage across the map, killing en masse, and featuring unique content relating to this infamous pandemic. Themed outfits are a smaller series of ruler designer options to customise your character assets in theme with the physician-patient gameplay. Funerals and feasts are two new activity options are now available with legendary feasts being an alternative form of feast to help spread legends across the map by persuading potential promoters. On the other hand, funerals aim to help soothe the loss of a character, perhaps after a plague, giving you the chance to reduce some stress or maybe catapult your legitimacy on the back of their passing. Legendary buildings have arrived as a potential successor to CK2's great work system as a high level reward for legends, providing the ability to create relevant structures such as statues or palaces relating to the theme of the legend you have completed. There are of course other additions, but with the core bulk of content covered in this core DLC, going forward I hope to talk about the most impactful content the update brings, and not so much the isolated content, so forgive me if I do not cover an entire section for male pattern baldness. But anyway, shall we begin? Plagues, an eventful sickness. To my mind, the introduction of plagues to the game has been a really great implementation, at least mechanically. Plagues have been long missed since CK2, and much of the community was overjoyed to see their return in Legends of the Dead. When I first saw the way that diseases are able to spread on the map, it has allowed for anxiety and dread to hit as you await a devastating plague to hit your court and perhaps wipe out you and your heirs. It both adds difficulty for those who sought a more challenging experience, while also providing role-playing with plagues being named after cultures, regions, or people, and creating a player-reactive system to deal with the oncoming threat. So why then 
has much of this part of the DLC been rejected by audiences, and more so aspects of Plague's been seen as unentertaining to the game, resulting in a mostly negative review on Steam. I believe that the Plague mechanic itself is not the issue. I think it's all the events surrounding the Plague mechanic that makes it frustrating. When a Plague hits you, you are met with the A Shadow Over Wherever event, where you are punished with a significant legitimacy hit and an expectation to find a physician. Following this are a few other events that basically demand gold from you, or tax you with stress and other debuffs. In short, getting hit with a plague has no fun gameplay. Crusader Kings 3 is a notoriously easy game once you figure out its mechanics. Achieving things becomes trivial and there's very few obstacles to stop or at least limit that success. The hope for plagues was to curb your enthusiasm by increasing the chances of an untimely succession or having your children, who safely assume have the title of heir, just passing away to the measles. I believe that the plague mechanics have succeeded in that endeavour and have done so well. Children do not live as long. Where they fail is all the other debuffs you get in addition to that, such as the aforementioned gold and legitimacy hits, but also in development. As plagues spread, they lower the development of the counties they hit, reducing the gold and levy count they provide. Due to the frequency of plagues and the severity of their devastation, the game now struggles to maintain growth for both AI and the player, making the desire to vastly reduce plague's appearance a common feeling. So, what is to be done? I do not believe this feature is bad, it's quite fortunate that the actual core component of diseases, spreading across the map visually, is actually the best part. What needs reworking is the debuffs and the events. When a plague hits, perhaps instead of getting a flat legitimacy loss, you could get a scaling loss that doesn't punish those who are already behind their expected level of legitimacy. Instead of getting the same few repeated events that drain you of gold, stress and debuffs, there could be more alternative options to capitalise on a dark period of illness, such as the ruler inheriting the wealth of lost villages, maybe an opportunity for an orphan to come to court to fill the vacancy a plague may have left in your own succession, or maybe even a, a unique hunt sighting where a diseased animal is spotted, famed for spreading plague, and thus you have to embark on hunting it down. There are plenty of opportunities to really expand on the event system to make it not just a negative experience, but maybe an opportunistic one as well. To close this section, it seems to me that the theme of CK3 and its updates remains unchanged. The core mechanics are good, the visuals of plagues are good, but the essential event system suffers from its recurring issue I've actually talked about in one of my previous Chapter 3 wishlist videos. We need more variety of events with less frequency of them occurring. Having the same thing happen over and over again brings little joy, and when those said events harm you and your playthrough, they begin to lower the game's fun as well. Legitimacy. Legit or quit? Legitimacy is another mechanic added to increase the depth of difficulty the game needed attention to. Working in a scaling bar system, I think in its simplest form, it actually does okay at providing some accountability to your actions throughout the game. No more killing random rulers and waving off the negative opinion modifiers, because now everyone will judge you harshly for foul actions. This to me is especially well done with punishing marrying lowborn partners aimlessly, as a way to curb people trying to find partners with the best genetics for their offspring. With the praise out of the way, there is of course more to say. Beyond what I just said, the legitimacy mechanic can seem a little too rigid and a little too hollow. To go back to marrying a lowborn, while yes, it does come across as below my station as let's say King of France, it's a shame there lacks any mechanic to justify my choices and negate some of the legitimacy loss. In addition, the ways to meaningfully grow legitimacy are seemingly locked behind DLC-related content, such as the legendary feasts, the funerals, the uh, le legitimacy legacy, and legend creation. 
while the ways to lose it are plentiful to the base game, seen with plagues, notable marriages, imprisonments, murders, and losing battles and wars. While this may not affect players as badly with the DLC, I think it does highlight an issue that the scales of power lie a little too heavily towards becoming illegitimate and can feel like players are being punished for not buying the Legends of the Dead DLC. Something I found to be odd, speaking to a more rigid and hollow system, is how legitimacy feels disconnected from your character's long-standing role. The system does an alright job at recognising immediate shifts to legitimacy, such as losing a battle, faith in your ruler is lost as 500 levies have disappeared forever, and people are going to doubt your right to rule. Makes sense. But let's say I have a ruler who has been in power for 30 years. No change in succession, no usurpers. Shouldn't a ruler who has held their title for a good period of time gain a sort of presumptive legitimacy to that title? I think a rework could help with a sort of settled legitimacy, where the longer you rule, a settled legitimacy score kind of marks on the level where you should tick towards. If you fall below it, you will slowly tick back up over time towards it to reflect the general assurance on the stability of a leader who has been in charge for a considerable time. To wrap up some thoughts about legitimacy, the introduction of the mechanic itself I believe to be a positive one, and I do hope they build on it to make it a more fleshed out system than what it is right now. For those with the DLC, it can be a funeral and a legendary feast to solve any issue it provides. For those without the DLC, it's a horrible annoyance, requiring you to do repeated wars, winning battles and activities just to maintain your expected level of legitimacy. I think to some players, there was an argument to be made that legitimacy should not have been tied to an individual character, but to each individual title that they hold. Having a high right to rule over France does not mean you should necessarily have a high right to rule over Italy, and I can understand that perspective. That being said, I feel to truly reflect that system, the legitimacy mechanic would need a good amount of complete overhaul to interact with all of the different types of legitimacy between individual titles, and that kind of goes beyond the scope of a small update and minor bug fix, and so for that, all we can hope for is that this mechanic won't be abandoned, and see innovation and iteration as we move on through future DLCs. How likely or unlikely that is, I leave up to you. Legends. Born to die? For both plagues and legitimacy, I felt that it was quite easy to speak to the positives they both provide. Plagues fill a gap that was much needed, but are set back by their repeated events, just as it is with travel and activities. Legitimacy does expand difficulty and challenges reckless gameplay, but falls short of its own ambition with finite utility. Legends then, are a beast of their own, for they are a part of this DLC. I can truly say I was disappointed. To the positives, I enjoy the process of unlocking a seed through a great deed or decision. I really like the mirror they've created between plagues spreading across the world visually and the celebrity status um, of your legendary protagonist being spread in a similar measure. Akin to the plagues then, the actual core mechanic I do not believe to be bad. So why are legends so disappointing? Well, they bear so little game impact. A common comparison I hear is between CK3's legends and CK2's bloodline system. Some people have rejected this comparison, but considering that Paradox named the dynasty legacy relating to legends as heroic bloodlines, I think the system speaks for itself. And so an issue that was wanted to be avoided was how CK2 bloodlines felt like massive power buffs you were getting with nothing else beyond them. As mentioned earlier, CK3 has already suffered from lack of difficulty, and with plagues and legitimacy here to ease that, it would be counterproductive to restore bloodlines from CK2 that work as even further stat boosts to a game that's already bloated with stat boosts, buffs, 
and tons of other rewards. Unfortunately though, the scale has tipped the other way. Legends have been implemented to be standoffish in game impact that they can feel a waste of time to even interact with. Legend seeds are the basis to starting legends. They can be acquired through completing major decisions as great rewards, but also just randomly given by your court chronicler for doing nothing. Upon gaining said seed, you must now spend a significant amount of gold spreading your legend across the land to unlock a series of ever-increasing rewards, depending on how far you can spread your legend and thus upgrade your reward tier. The rewards you get are okay, I guess. There are free legend types and thus free types of rewards. Holy legends let you more easily spread your faith. Heroic legends let you abandon your realm and effectively go on a Varangian adventure for a title of your choosing. And legitimizing legends let you integrate another title into your primary title instantly. While these rewards are by no means bad, I actually think the adventure one is a really cool idea. They are all instant bonuses. You use them immediately, within that lifetime, and that's it. For a DLC focused on death and remembering those who came before so you can take advantage of their achievements for your gain, the actual benefits of Legends post-mortem is seemingly minimal. That being said, there are legendary buildings that you can unlock related to the legend that you completed that will have long-standing presence on the map after your death, but these come with their own weaknesses that I'll explore later. The final criticism I lay at the feet of Legends is its failure to balance rarity and lack of rarity, which comes back to an earlier complaint, event spam. As you spread your legend, you will encounter the same repeated events over and over again. Do you want to become immortal? Do you want to mention your wife or a random lover? It's a very, very finite list. The same issue plagues the game as it stands. The game needs a more variety of events with less frequency. As I mentioned at the start of this section, legends are actually not that rare to get as they can be found by court chroniclers, but also for doing things you might do passively, like holding a holy site. So the legends themselves are pretty common, the events in the legends are very common, the rewards for completing any of the three legend types are the same, and there is no difference mechanically between a randomly generated legend seed versus a very difficult and challenging legend seed you could unlock from restoring the Roman Empire or elevating the High Kingdom of Man and the Isles. So what is to be done then? Well, sadly, unlike the prior sections, I don't have a few balance patches and additional event reworks that I think can fix things here. I believe the community feels entirely underwhelmed by the legend system, because once you have done each legend type once, you have effectively seen the entirety of the content they offer. In order to take some steps to vastly improve legends, there may be a need for an entire redraft of the legends themselves, where they come from, the amount of types of legends, how you develop them, the events you get for them, and of course the rewards you get from them. Here I could offer some potential ideas. I think there could be another type of legend, superior to the three current legends, that offers rewards that last throughout your entire playthrough. To hit the nose bluntly, you could call those bloodline legends that literally create a bloodline upon their completion and offering you buffs for your descendants. They should be much, much rarer, only be achievable after a great feat like restoring the Roman Empire to make the significance of these legends feel far superior while not making the mechanic see less use as the other more common holy and heroic legends are still in the game for those smaller rewards. To answer the issue of power creep, by adding another source of random buffs forever, I do not believe that locking the permanent buffs behind difficult decisions and challenges is going to cause massive power bloat, because if you've already achieved the Roman Empire, I mean at that point you kind of deserve a few more rewards. Additionally, not every dynasty buff has to be a stat increase. In Crusader Kings 2, Bloodlines did not just offer stats, 
but new mechanical unlocks. The blood of Sasan bloodline enabled you to do sky burials. Perhaps the CK3 legend Sons of Skorta could unlock your dynasty to do a mummification ritual during the funeral activity, even if your religion doesn't allow it, meaning you can match up some ancient Egyptian heritage to your Scottish playthrough. William the Conqueror's bloodline in CK2 allowed for free legitimization of bastards. Minor mechanics like this are not stat boosts, but much more thematic very small things for you to inherit throughout your playthrough, and so the legends of CK3 could benefit from some of these very small rewards. Legendary buildings, but not so legendary. So I did mention that the legends did offer one reward that does last throughout your campaign, namely the legendary buildings. Upon completing a highest tier legend, you have the opportunity to clear a randomly selected barony that you control to have a special building slot. In that slot, you have the option to pick between five different types of legendary buildings. A shrine, a statue, a palace, a watchtower, and a hunting lodge. After that, you will need to spend 1,500 gold on building the building. And that's it. This may not come as a surprise to many of you, I mean, it does what it says on the tin, but truth be told, legendary buildings came to me personally as a huge disappointment. The thing is, back in Crusader Kings 2, there were also legendary buildings, but they were called Great Works, and after going to great lengths to build them, such as how you went great lengths to spread your legends, you could capitalise on a completed work with great rewards, but it didn't end there. If you go look at the CK2 wiki, you can see the plethora of upgrades that great works could get after their completion for all kinds of choices. Drunkards would build a tavern at the great work, maybe you could build one in CK3 for stress loss. Evil characters could build a torture chamber to unlock new intimidation mechanics, and it goes further as unique work variants would have relevant upgrades to their work type, so cathedral? could upgrade the bells to help siege defence, mosques could introduce soup kitchens to help the poor and reduce peasant uprising. The list goes on and on. I would now like to show you the upgrade track for legendary buildings in CK3. Nothing. I mean, you get a series of okayish buffs, but nothing else. No way to connect the building to the legend it came from, no upgrades relevant to the building type, <laughs> no upgrades at all, nothing. This extends to the hospital building they added to combat plagues. In CK2, this building also had various upgrade options, while in CK3, it's a linear path with incremental upgrades to the boosts it offers. So again, this may not be a major gripe for most people, and I understand that, but I do think it reflects the lack of depth between one game versus the other in terms of implementation. Simply, I would like to see a return to the older multiple choice building upgrades, as opposed to the linear path progression system we have now, where there's no real choice along the way or character input. Not for all buildings, but really for legendary buildings and maybe the hospitals. It would be so nice to see compared to their current iteration. In summary, a tale of woe? Considering the criticism I have levied at the DLC and update, you may think I believe this was a terrible addition to CK3, but this is not true. The plagues and legitimacy systems are good additions, even if their implementation could use some additional reworking and balancing. A lot of the smaller changes I appreciate too. The male pattern boldness and scarring really builds up your character's aged stories. The 3D map and table, while not really relevant to the gameplay itself and not something I care too much to cover in this video, it is a nice visual aesthetic and I think some players do like it but would also appreciate the ability to turn it off at their own discretion. My true gripe lies with the legend system and its rewards. I can find very little favourable interpretation for the future of CK3 with its legend system in their current form. Judging by the community's reaction, this could mirror their thoughts too. My long-standing point about the need for 
more variety of events with less frequency is also becoming a louder talking point, so I'm interested to see where that develops in the future. Rating this then is hard for me, because the feature list is quite split. The plagues and legitimacy are part of the free update, and so in that sense the game has probably seen a net positive in content, especially after further refinement. The Legends DLC, however, feels too empty and disappointing for me to actually recommend buying, unless you are highly invested in the game and the entirety of its content. When I recall other DLCs past, I think I rate this akin to Wards and Wardens, in which that added a couple of activities, new events, quad positions, but of course this one comes with its mainstay feature, Legends, but considering that, that Legends have fallen flat, it's arguable that this is slightly worse than what I considered for Wards, especially when you consider it has a much higher price tag, and then I guess I'll give it a 5 out of 10. If they fix up the plagues and legitimacy interactions even more than the changes they've made thus far, I could be persuaded that it's a 6 out of 10, but to truly go beyond that, I think the legend system needs some urgent TLC, and the event system core to the game, that needs to head straight to the operating room. I could go on talking about this DLC, the future of CK3, and more of the features inside of it, but I think this video has gone on long enough. So with that being said, I will say thank you for listening to this rather varied, rambly Legends of the Dead review. I'm feeling okay to settle on the DLC being okay. Feel free to tell me what you think of the DLC in the comments section below. If you liked the video, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe. I am very, very interested to see how they handle Roads to Power after the public reception to Legends of the Dead and seeing the long anticipated landless mechanic. So, I guess I'll see you then. Bye.